Okay, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Uh, welcome to the Back to School webinar series for Confident Parents, Confident Kids. Uh, this one is going to focus on how to set up our physical learning environment for school success, for learning success. I'm Jennifer Miller. I really appreciate you joining us today. We had a, a huge sign up and I know many are watching, uh, gonna watch the recording who couldn't join live. Um, I am going to go ahead and share my screen so that you can view um, the PowerPoint. Um, and if you haven't yet, please do, um, please do, uh, introduce yourself in the chat box and let us know, uh, where you're coming from, where you're, you are based today. And, um, we'd love to, to say hello to you and, um, know where you're coming from. Um, I am going, while people are joining, I will share the, I will play the PowerPoint in the whole screen, but I'm going to keep it uh, minimized because I want to be able to let people in to the uh, webinar uh, as they show up. So um, again, welcome. Thank you for joining today. Uh, my name is Jennifer Miller, and uh, I have been working in the field of social and emotional learning for 25 years now uh, when I became a parent 12 years ago and I was working with schools integrating social and emotional learning helping teachers and administrators I said to myself um, I need to be doing this with my son in my own household and I started looking for resources and I could not find enough resources that were truly aligned with the research base in how we know we can advance children's social and emotional development and so Confident Parents Confident Kids was born. Um, I have uh, written a book by a similar uh, name, and um, and now I uh, I speak all over the country and the world on every topic related to parenting and social emotional learning. I know that we are many of us are. Uh, home now. Uh, either we are hosting remote learning with our children or we're actually homeschooling. And so it is a, a whole new world for many of us. And uh, so I'm eager to provide resources to help you get your home environment set up for learning success. Um, so uh, welcome to those who just joined. Welcome, Tara. If you want to put in the chat uh, where you're joining from, that would be great. Um, and I wanted to, to just start off with a few uh, learning Zoom learning agreements. And um, as, as I do everything, I want to model what you can do with your children. So this is something that you can teach your family members and, um, and help practice with your children so that they understand good Zoom etiquette and know how to uh, join a Zoom classroom. So I noticed that the participants have already muted. That's really important to teach your children to mute first and how to mute. Uh, it sounds simple, but if there are many voices and clatters and, and dog barks in the background, it's really hard to know, to hear what's going on. Um, place questions and comments in the chat box and uh, I will try to, to attend to them throughout, but if I am not able to, um, then I will definitely reserve time at the end uh, to go over questions and make sure they're all responded to. Also, um, I think hand signals are really effective. So raising your hand if I have something to say, or I noticed Zainab already used the, the raise hand function. There's also a, a digital graphic of a hand that you can raise. Um, me too. This is a nice symbol for me too. Uh, extending your pinky finger out and putting your thumb to your heart. 
Uh, so for children especially, they want to relate, they want to connect when things are being said. So using the Me Too really works well. Um, also, hooray, right? The, the hand signal or the sign language for clapping. Uh, yes, a thumbs up. No, a thumbs down. Maybe a thumbs in the middle. And, and hand on the heart when you care, when you're showing care, especially if someone is uh, sharing a sadness um, or something that is difficult for them, uh, you can show your care that way. Um, okay, so I wanted to ask, uh, and I'm, I'm going to stop sharing so that I can be sure and see your comments. Um, but help me uh, understand uh, with your, in your back to school days, uh, how's it going? How are you feeling? What's going on for you? Um, I start every presentation finding out how people are feeling. So, so let me know. Um, and I'll share, we, uh, we started with our school um, and had such a difficult experience with remote learning that we have decided to homeschool, which I really never thought I would do. Um, but it was uh, so challenging. So we're in a major sea change right now. Um, so this week I've been feeling a bit overwhelmed, honestly. Uh, with it all. So maybe um, maybe you've had some similar experiences with supporting remote learning at home. Um, and I'm trying to view the chat, but I'm having trouble um, scrolling down here. Uh, here we go. Um, okay, great. So I'm going to go back um thank you for sharing and um let's let's take a look at our purpose today um we the purpose really of today is to offer you ideas for organizing your physical space uh and we there are webinars as you've likely seen coming up for um for your emotional environment and your social environment. And we are treating those separately, although we know they're all integrated, but there is a lot to say about, uh, about each and about how they impact one another. So, um, so we're, I'm hopefully gonna give you some very practical tips, tricks, and tools that you can leave with today. And I promise to follow up with some tools as well. Um, so we're going to talk about learning agreements. We're going to talk about schedules and routines. We're going to talk about your child's motivation. And we're going to talk about the physical space. Um, I, I have to say, and I say this in every presentation, every family culture is unique. You are your own best problem solver for your family. So I can offer you tips that I have seen have worked with many families that with whom I've worked, but ultimately you have to say, this will work in my family or this aligns with my values or this doesn't. Um, so I just say that as a caveat, there is uh, no such thing as perfect parenting. And right now at this moment with COVID-19 and uh, racial justice being at the fore um, and so many issues, including economic, political, and social, we are in trying times. And so there are no right answers. Um, but I think it's really important to come together as a supportive network to say, how can we learn from each other? How can we build on what the other is doing and, um, and really create a learning network during this time when we can really feel isolated? Uh, so I have to ask you, what big picture lessons could your child or children be learning from this unique time? Certainly we know that we've been enduring sustained crisis, but we also know that crisis leads to transformation. So I'd like you to take a minute, and even if you have a piece of paper, write down what big picture lessons 
could your child or children be learning for this for from this unique time and i'm going to give you just a second to respond to that Okay. I'm seeing uh, resilience. I'm seeing stress management. Patience. Wow. For all of us, we're, we're learning patience. Uh, not just us as parents, although certainly we are, but also our children, uh, because things aren't happening as quickly as, as we are used to. Um, Tara says, so far, so good. I made some physical changes in my children's room and a work setup. There have been challenges. Continued motivation is my biggest challenge. Um, yes, and th that is so understandable, and I think we will... Uh, we will definitely try to address motivation today. So that's right in alignment. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to just share this graphic. Some of you might be familiar with it. Um, everything that I do uh, aligns with social and emotional skills. And these are the five competencies that are core to social and emotional learning. They include self-awareness, self-management, social awareness, relationship skills, and responsible decision making. And when you, I, I conducted some research and, and I asked parents, what are your hopes for your own parenting and for your children? And they said things like patience, uh, not surprisingly. Uh, they want to be happy, encouraging, loving, kind, and they hope that their children will be happy, fulfilled, confident, uh, and we found in our research, there was a direct relationship from these hopes and dreams our parents said were important and social and emotional skills, which may be no surprise to you. So it's great to keep in mind as we think about the learning environment in our home. I um, have worked with a wonderful organization called, uh, or a, a social emotional learning curriculum, more specifically called Responsive Classroom. And they have this great book called The First Six Weeks of School. Um, and I, I love the first six weeks of school because they talk about the fact that setting up your learning environment is a process. It is not an event. It does not need to be all organized and set up immediately right as we begin school. Although as parents, I know we feel that pressure to have it all set up. Um, but really, we, uh, our children need to be a part of that setup. So breathe a little, take your time, discover what their needs are as you go, and, and plan on your need to augmenting the space. Um, it, we need to create a, a, a place, a label, a home for every tool, every supply, every textbook. And our homes uh, can be small. I, I live in a uh, small urban home. Uh, we don't have to have extensive space in order to have a home for every school tool, but it does take time. So include that in your learning day. Uh, label everything together and find a home for it together so that your child really feels responsible for putting those school tools back in their home. Let's talk about your physical space. This is my son, Ethan. Um, he had a little kitty table. Uh, we, in the spring, he worked at the dining room table. It all worked, but this year we actually got him a desk uh, because he's gonna be home for school all year. You don't have to spend a lot of money, but kids do need a clean, open, 
hard surface to work on. They need uh, some, uh, some kind of surface that can get dirty because surely they'll need to cut, they'll need to paste, they'll need to marker something. Uh, they need adequate task lighting and be sure you sit in the space and try to read something and see if the lighting is adequate. They need a comfortable chair. They need, um, they need to, not have distractions around. So if the, the toy bin is right there, uh, it's going to be really tempting. So how can you clear a uh, clean, organized space where they don't have a lot of visual distractions? Um, and it needs to be quiet, but it also needs to be really accessible in your home. This is right in our living space. Um, so how can you make it accessible to whoever the person is that is going to be um, supporting your child? Uh, and so I'll ask you, what I forget, what's, what, what's in your physical space that, um, that has been really important to you? Please uh, let me know. Um, also, uh, the school tools need to be cared for and, and really owned by your child. So uh, how will you organize all of your supplies needed for your school work? Um, where will you store printable work? Because surely there will be worksheets. Surely there'll be stuff that, that you have to look at and hold. Uh, so is it a binder or do you have file folders? Where can your child be responsible for putting all math work and all language arts work? Um, what reference guides might come in handy? And it's really nice to have some physical books, uh, like a dictionary, like a Spanish dictionary, um, so that they're not looking at a screen all the time, but they also find that they can learn to use books as reference guides. Um, and then do you need extra supports like a calculator, uh, like a doodle pad, like a fidget? Maybe it will help them focus if they have a fidget at their desk. Um, also, do you have a consistent place for your child to display work that they're proud of? Again, it doesn't have to take up a lot of space. It could be a piece of rope with a couple clothespins uh, and they don't need to display every piece of work, but how could you um, have it, uh, a couple clothespins at the ready or magnets, uh, whatever clips at the ready so that they could display work that they're really proud of. Tara says, I purchased a $4 milk crate from Target it works like a locker for my fourth grader. I love that. Cheap, easy, accessible, fun, and, and just at the right height, right? Uh, and you can put folders, notebooks, Chromebook, all next to her desk. Um, painted the wall behind her as a magnet chalkboard where she can hang work and write notes. I love that. That's fabulous. Uh, and really addresses the idea of her being able to post work that she's proud of. Um, I encourage you to get a hold of a timer. Now you can use a regular old kitchen timer. I also tend to like the minute timers that are just um, hourglasses, but they're minute uh, and they're plastic uh, for different purposes. But timers can be such a lifesaver because instead of you being the nag, we've got to do this within this time frame do it, do it, do it. Instead of that, you put the ownership in the child by giving them a timer and you can help uh, them learn about setting the timer. Uh, but it is a physical indicator where you can move a child from one task to another. You can help them complete work faster because it's in a certain time frame. Uh, you can even help them try to beat their time if you're trying to speed up their pace. Um, it helps them focus their attention. Um, so the timer can be used for so many different purposes and uh, really be an important homeschool tool. Um, 
I also encourage you at some point, and it doesn't have to be the first day, it doesn't have to be the first week, but as a family to sit down and talk about your hopes and dreams for your child's learning and for their school year. Uh, we can get into the pace and busyness of trying to be responsive to school and never stop and talk about our hopes and dreams. And really, uh, you know, when, when several participants talked about motivation, um, our children want to be motivated or can be motivated by their hopes and dreams. And we can recall that throughout the year when times are tough or we're frustrated. So how can you um, brainstorm hopes and dreams in our family? We put it on a, a big sheet of paper and we leave it up for a while to refer to so that we can really focus our, our learning goals on our hopes and dreams. Uh, and then uh, instead of skipping right to, to rules or learning agreements, of course we need those, but how can we evolve our learning agreements out of our hopes and dreams? So there is a natural progression to say to our children, okay, if you are hoping that you will learn about fish this year in your science class, um, because you're fascinated with swimming and the ocean and learning about fish, then, uh, then we need to develop some learning agreements so that we can focus our energy and, uh, and really get into the learning environment. Um, so then, you know, brainstorm ideas, but, uh, and of course in brainstorming, any idea is valid. You just get out all your family ideas for learning agreements. But ultimately, you want to create a few simple statements. Three would be ideal. And how can you frame them in the positive? In other words, this is what we will do, not what we won't do. So we will listen when uh, someone else is talking and wait for our turn. That would be just one example of a learning agreement. Um, we will... Uh, Maybe you want to create an indicator for asking you for help because you're working while your child is remote learning. Um, you could be on calls or, or Zoom uh, meetings all day. So is there a, an acceptable uh, getting your attention signal? Is it a hand signal? Is it? Do you want your child to raise their hand? Do you want them to hand you a note? But how can you agree upon those setups in your home in advance so that you're not creating a hotbed for frustrations, but instead you're proactively saying, we know that you're going to need to ask for help. So how can you ask for help in ways that are acceptable to all family members? Um, so let's talk a bit about routines. And, uh, and specifically about your learning time. Um, so uh, I think one thing that's particularly challenging is to think about the transition into the school day when you're not leaving your house. I saw a great uh, TikTok video my son showed me of a boy uh, and his mom saying, first day of school, and he walked out of the house all excited and turned right around and walked right back in. <laughs> this is what we're all doing, right? Or many of us. So uh, how do you create the mental um, flexibility, the, the mental sense of, of transition when you are literally in the same room or in the same environment every day, day after day? Um, there are ways to do it. So I'll ask that question. How can we create that sense of transition from family life into school life when we're at home? Um, let me know your ideas in the chat. I'd love to hear some of them. And, uh, and I certainly will share some of my ideas. Um, 
Uh, you you may have heard throughout uh, the the pandemic, throughout the stressful times, that routines create psychological safety, and they do. So for our children and for that transition into the learning day, the morning routine really is critical. And I'm gonna um, try to share a video and. Um, if you could indicate a thumbs up if you can hear it, I'm gonna stop it if you can't hear it, but I'm hoping that, um, that we can watch this video together about the, the morning routine. I wanna talk uh, briefly about your morning routine. Uh, the morning routine can really offer a sense of safety to children as they start their learning day, if you're consistent with it. I uh, encourage parents to talk about it when you're not in the morning routine. The morning routine is, is, can be a pressure cooker, even at home, because everybody's got business to attend to. We're all trying to get those tasks done, brushing teeth, getting dressed, getting breakfast, so that we can move on to the work of the day. So how can you be consistent about your morning routine by talking about it at a time, maybe Sunday afternoon, when you're not in the morning routine? How can you have your child write or draw your plan and keep it super simple? We wake up at whatever time. We get dressed. Uh, and be sure that when you're talking about your plan, you're not only focusing on the business of the morning, but you're also looking for ritual opportunities for connection. So we have a hallway hug before getting dressed in the morning. We have a quick connection. It doesn't take long, and then he's on his way. What can you do to create caring connections in the morning? It, it can be very brief, but to, to be consistent, to get business accomplished, and then to move on with your day. Okay, so it, the idea is really that um, everyone in the family takes responsibility for their role, and if you discuss it in advance, uh, and everybody has a sense of the business that they have to take care of, uh, it can go much more smoothly. Um, so I have a lot more guidance on setting up a morning routine. This is tends to be a big challenge in family life and can really be a source of chaos. Um, so I will be sure and follow up for those who registered with a little more details on how to uh, deal with difficulties with the morning routine and how to make sure that you set it up in a way that's really smooth, connecting and contributing for all. Um, one way in particular is to be sure that when you make a plan and you actually implement the plan that you notice when your child is trying to take responsibility, even if it's small, uh, it's hard because we get in the mode of the gotcha. No, you need to refocus your energy here and here, but we, we forget to notice when things are going smoothly because we're just taking a deep breath. That's it's our moment to say, oh, thank goodness it's going well. But really, uh, we need to notice and call out when our children are um, acting in ways that we want to reinforce and see more of the same. And then I encourage you as well, what is your morning routine? Uh, how are you um, creating self-control and patience and mindfulness for your day ahead. Uh, I use my coffee as a reminder to take 10 deep breaths before I begin. Um, so I'd ask you, what about your morning routine? How are you creating that well of patience by, uh, by taking some deep breaths, by taking some quiet time, uh, maybe reading some wisdom that can set you on a good course for the day? It is, it is truly critical. 
Um, and then how are you transitioning into the learning environment? Um, we back in the spring i went on facebook live every single morning with my family and we helped others and people joined from all around the world and we said this global pledge of allegiance and we also did a guided uh mindfulness exercise each morning uh, but how will you transition into the learning day your family can choose to to say something together maybe you're a praying family and you want to say a prayer uh, you're welcome to use this global pledge of allegiance uh, you're welcome to to talk about what are our intentions for the learning day what do we want what are our hopes for our family uh, and maybe it is that we hope we'll all be patient and give one another grace uh, but that can really help set, have a, a, a consistent tradition maybe we come together and hold hands uh, and and prepare for the learning day together and then how will you schedule out your learning time? So it could be that if you're doing remote learning with school, your school has given you a very prescriptive schedule. Uh, but I know a lot of schools are leaving a lot of flexibility in that so that you can watch recordings of teacher presentations asynchronously and there are lots of choices. So what's really critical is that you develop a schedule together and make sure that an adult uh, caregiver is designated as the point person for asking questions. Even if they need to be on calls or working, who is the go-to person while your child is learning? So important. Now, um, also when you're creating your schedule, how can you be sure that you have a mental and physical health basics checklist um, or the, their physical and mental health in mind? We cannot sit in front of a Zoom all day. Children were not born with that ability. We really need to get up and move around. We need to drink water. We need some fresh air. So how are you going to build that into your child's day? Uh, it's super important to think about. Now this this daily schedule that you see here was created by a 10 year old uh, with some support from his family. I, I'm not kidding. It really was created by a, a friend of ours, a 10 year old. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's a beautiful example of looking at mental and physical health basics in your schedule. Um, also, how can you post key messages? We're talking about um, motivation and, uh, you know, I think it's worth posting some key messages about your learning philosophy. In other words, we don't expect you to get it perfect the first time. And in, in fact, no one gets it perfect the first time. Um, so what's important to you with your child's learning? Post that, write it big and post it. Do they, do they need to hear that they can make mistakes, that mistakes are part of learning? Do they need to hear that it's important to seek help, that we all need to ask for help? Do they need to hear, you got this? You, this, is, this may be challenging, but we know that you got this. Uh, so be sure and post key messages uh, and reinforce them with your children. Your attitude about learning matters. It so matters. There was a fascinating study done uh, and where they looked at two mothers who were supporting their child's learning. And one uh, leaned over and said, oh, oh, that's not right. Oh, I, I think you've got to change that. And corrected many of their child's mistakes. Uh, one, one group. The other group said, you got this, and really responded to questions, but didn't fix mistakes. And you can, you can, uh, you can imagine which helped the child feel more confident. It was the group of moms who were saying, you got this, and kind of stepping back and, and answering questions and being supportive when the child needed it, 
but not fixing mistakes. Our children need to be able to fail in order to learn. Um, and I, I use this, uh, this wonderful chart, how hard are you working, uh, as a self-rating system. So your child can look at it and say, well, today I, I feel like I was about at a four, or today I was a nine. I worked really hard, uh, but it is a great self-rating system. And then uh, be sure that you're including in your schedule brain breaks. We all need to walk away. If your child's getting frustrated, and we will talk much more specifically in the emotional um, webinar, but if your child is getting frustrated, instead of saying, dig in, we've got to persevere, well, they can dig in for the long run, but sometimes it's much more effective to walk away, walk outside, get a drink of water, set your timer for five, 10 minutes, get a little break in, and then return to the learning fresh and say, okay, now we're gonna dig in and we can do this. Let's talk a bit about the digital environment. Um, that it, it can be invisible to us as parents, though we need to be supportive of the digital environment as well. If you have a 12 or 13 year old like I do, uh, he wants to say, hands off, mom, I got this, which is wonderful. But also uh, parents need to be, or caregivers need to be involved in supporting the learning that happens digitally. So how can you make the digital environment unique to your child? Can they have their own window where they create their own screensaver? And, and can you create folders together to organize their work? So how can you create an organized space in their digital world that reflects the physical space in their physical world? Um, one that will prevent many uh, a conflict is just keeping a log uh, at the ready of usernames and passwords. It's just a necessity, right? Uh, it's too easy to forget those things. How can you help your child create bookmarks of essential sites? How can you tour together essential school sites so that you know all the places you need to go to find your work? Um, and then also, as we did in the beginning of this session, practice a Zoom meeting together. Go to different parts of your home and, and try out the hand signals. Uh, use those etiquette. Um, simple, simple practices so your child is ready to participate. Then how can you think about other routines throughout your day? There are going to be transitions uh, from morning to learning time, from learning time to lunch, from lunch to back to learning time. Um, so how can you think about those transitions? How can you plan for cleanup time? Uh, and maybe you have a school cleanup time and a play cleanup time, but certainly you wanna involve your family members all in contributing to cleanup versus mom or dad being the one at the end of the night who's exhausted picking up uh, toys or learning supplies. We have all been there. <laughs> But we need to prepare our family members to be significant contributors in cleaning up our space. Uh, and then um, homework, dinner, and bedtime. So I have uh, a household responsibilities by age and stage chart that I will provide for you in the follow-up. And I would just say kids are much more motivated to clean up as you if you work as a team if they know exactly what they need to do and where things go, and if you offer some choices. So the choice is not, are we gonna clean up or not? That's not a good choice because we need to clean up. So a choice might be, are you going to put away your textbooks or are you gonna put away your markers? Um, so what's, and, and I'll help you um, with the other. Uh, but that can help with motivation as well. And then our sleep routine is going to be super important um, and can be a great challenge. We're coming off of summer. 
where our children probably had a lot more freedom and flexibility with bedtime, yet we know that they can't learn well during the day, nor will they have a whole lot of self-control if they've stayed up late. I encourage you as a caregiver to look up the appropriate amount of hours that science says your the age of your child needs. And I put that link in here. So, uh, and I encourage you not to look it up yourself, but to do it with your child so that you learn together. It's not mommy being mean and saying you need 10 hours of sleep. It's science saying 10 year olds need 10 hours of sleep. Uh, and how can we plan a bedtime routine that's responsive to that? Also, I encourage you to think about business first uh, in the routine and then connection and fun stuff second. Um, so how can you put brushing teeth, getting changed into pajamas, uh, whatever your routine is first and then second, maybe you read together or say a prayer together or snuggle or do pillow talk together, that connecting as a second step. And, and I'll just remind you, if you're creating conducive conditions for sleep, that screens need to be off an hour before sleep time. Science tells us that is really critical for the brain to, to allow it to shut down. Um, so uh, be sure and do that. I also encourage people, our kids are spending a whole lot more time on screens. It is the reality of our current existence. And so how can you make a list together of favorite activities off screen so that when you're limiting screen time or you're saying it's enough, they have a list to go to. Screens are so high stimulus that when they come off, they don't know what to do. Um, and sometimes they need some prompting. So how can you create that list so you can say, oh, right, I enjoy puzzles or I, uh, I could get out my Lego set or I could get out a book uh, that I enjoy, or we could play a card game. Uh, I also encourage you to establish routines around arguing. Uh, and, and I don't know how, how many of you have already created uh, family routines around arguing, but um, the truth is, we can't assume that families are not going to argue. We can't say arguing is a, a weakness in family life. It's just not real. We fight um, in families uh, because we're together a lot, especially now. So then how can we be proactive about how we fight fairly? Um, I'm going to follow up with the Fighting Fairly Family Pledge for you. It is something that you can read through with your whole family. There are five simple, simple practices that you can agree to, to say, we, this is how we will fight fairly, and then six practices to avoid. And they're, they're ones that, um, that can be bad habits that we need to, to break, maybe blaming or criticizing another family member. We agree not to do those. Um, so it, it's something you can go over with your family and all sign together and you can work on as a family fighting fairly together. I also encourage you to set up a structure for sibling conflict. Again, it's going to happen, right? So why not have a structure in place to prevent, uh, to uh, not prevent, but actually help your children learn conflict management and take responsibility for their own role in the problem. 
So I encourage uh, families to try out the Peace Rose. And it's a great project. You can, you can make uh, a rose yourself. You can get tissue paper and uh, on my site, there's instructions for making your own rose or you can just get a fake one, uh, order a fake one online. But you put a rose somewhere very accessible in your household. And when there is a conflict, you, you help prepare by practicing with your children, uh, but whoever realizes that they're in the middle of a conflict goes and grabs the peace rose and they hand it to the other person. And by handing it to the other person, their sister or brother, the implication is let's work this out together. Uh, and so there, there is a uh, process you can teach your children. It's super simple, but think about how valuable, if you took the time out to get a rose, to practice this with your siblings or with your children, if you watch them do this between one another, how powerful would that be? Now, I have seen it work with a preschooler and a second grader. Uh, and they were really excited to use it and they, they did it beautifully. So I will follow up and give you more uh, content on that. Uh, but it is worth taking the time out to practice how you fight fairly in family life. I would also encourage you to reflect on your challenges. What are your parenting challenges right now? Uh, and how can you view them through the lens of social and emotional learning? In other words, if your challenge is bedtime, bedtime is a pain, your child refuses to go to bed on time, how do you reframe that and reflect on it as an opportunity to build social and emotional skills in your child? And in yourself, there is always a chance to do that with every challenge. So with the bedtime example, you might have to build self-awareness. Maybe your child isn't aware uh, that they're overtired. They aren't aware of how much sleep they need. Maybe you're building self-management skills, helping them self-soothe helping them calm down, let go of the worries of the day. Maybe you're building self-management skills in yourself as you grow your patience with your child who keeps getting out of bed over and over. But I ask you to reflect on that question. Um, it's easy to identify our challenges, but then it takes some, some real reflection to say, and how am I uh, now understanding what skills I can build in myself, what social emotional skills I can build in myself, and what social emotional skills I can build in my child. It's always an opportunity. Our children, uh, first and foremost, need a whole lot of love, whether they're, and we, we felt it in the baby days, but we, we know they still need it in the push me, pull you days of the tween and teen years. Um, and particularly now when we're in a moment of sustained crisis, uh, our children's moods are going to swing. Uh, there's going to be times of, of sadness. There's going to be times of frustration, anger, upset, and yet our children still need uh, the affirmation every day that we love them no matter what. So I'll remind you just how are you um, reminding them that no matter their, their big feelings, no matter their struggles and challenges, um, that you are there for them and that you love them no matter what. Um, these are kind of all the issues that we've gone through to set up your physical environment for learning success. And I'm committing to you to send out this checklist in follow-up. Checklists can be really, really effective. And um, if you've noticed medical uh, institutions, hospitals, doctors use checklists on a regular basis because 
we can't, we are responsible for so much. We can't keep everything in our heads. So over these six to eight first weeks of school, as you are working to set up your physical environment, learning environment, your social learning environment, your emotional learning environment. Here is a, a checklist, particularly for the, the physical elements that we went over that will remind you of what you can check off with your child. Uh, and you can make it very much a part of your learning day. So how can you take one thing a day, like today we're gonna label, all our stuff or today we're going to make sure that we have a home for everything and our child knows exactly where that home is going to be for our stuff um, i wanted to point you back to the confident parents confident kids website that there are tons of free resources on the site so if you're um, doing remote learning and you're looking for resources to help shake up your day. Uh, there are cooperative games listed by uh, social and emotional skill. Uh, check out those cooperative games. You could uh, do it as a, a transition uh, to break up the day uh, amongst family members. There are book recommendations, children's literature, there's nonfiction and fiction by age and stage and by social emotional skill. There are global exploration links, links to um, exploring various countries, animals, classrooms around the world, lunches around the world. Um, and then there are parent book recommendations and uh, family school partnership resources. So what are you taking away today? We talked about a lot. We talked about uh, how to create kind of a sacred, learning space where you have the physical space that you need in order for your child to learn well. We talked about the digital learning environment and how you can explore that together and set up norms and expectations for how your child will behave online. Um, we talked about setting conditions for fighting fairly because we know that arguments will arise. So um, what are you specifically taking away from today? And it's, it's a whole lot of information. So, uh, so we will be sure, uh, and I'm seeing that some joined late, uh, which is no worry at all. This is being recorded and you will get the presentation and you will also get a bunch of tools in follow-up so that you can watch it on your own time frame and um, be sure and be able to have tools to follow up. Um, also, this Monday, I am starting Mindful Mondays throughout the fall. Every Monday, it will be a half hour with families around the globe on Zoom uh, to get families' hearts, minds, and bodies ready for learning. So I hope you'll uh, join me for Mindful Mondays. You can sign up on the Confident Parents, Confident Kids site. Um, the next back to school webinar is how to set up the emotional environment for learning success. So we talked about motivation today. We will deep dive into all of the challenging emotions that parents are feeling and that children are feeling and how we can respond to them constructively and actually teach emotional intelligence in this rare moment when we're all home together. So I hope you'll join us again. There's a sign up on my site if you haven't already registered. And then I encourage you to check out my book. My Amazon is doing deep discounts now. I think this is $3 on the Amazon site. It has never been so expensive. And there is a social and emotional development guide by age and stage. So, um, so please check out the book as well. Um, I, uh, I will send out to everyone who joined today uh, a follow-up with all of the tools and the presentation. And I thank you so much for joining. And I'll look forward to the next webinar on how to set up the emotional environment for learning success. Thanks so much for joining. I wish you the best. 
Uh, I wish you all the patience in the world as you tackle these first few days of school and stay posted because I intend to share lots of free resources to support you. I'll also say, um, please be in communication. If there are specifics that you want guidance on, I am eager to produce content that will support you. We all need to support one another in this challenging time. So, uh, so let me know, shoot me an email, shoot me a message, and, uh, and I am happy to create content that specifically responds to your needs. So uh, thanks for joining today and you'll be receiving follow-up really soon. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.